Cool. You guys look sleepy. You guys having fun? No coffee? Oh, fail. Get the info. We need some Red Bull up in here. Would it help if I started dancing and shouting developers, 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 developers? Does that help? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> cool. All right, so this is a peerware desktop application development uh, with Ruby Threads and Jernetta. Uh, this is a, I, I'm actually really happy that there's been a lot of talks today about distributed computing, about threading, about I.O., because those are re all really important topics, um, specifically because you know, Ruby gets a lot of flack, I think, for not being very performant, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. And so uh, this talk does touch briefly on some of those, not to dwell on them and not to dwell on some of the other products or um, packages and gems that have already been released, uh, but really to talk about the paradigm of peer-aware peer desktop application development, and in, in some cases, server-aware or uh, peer-aware server-side development as well. This, is, this stuff really isn't specific to desktop applications. Uh, and also the way at OpenRain, like one of the tools that we released called Runetta, which is kind of in the area of uh, peer awareness and communication, which makes it pretty easy to develop those types of applications. And so let's get the business out of the way. Uh, I'm with OpenRain Elite Web Software in Phoenix. Um, these slides are as well as uh, Mark Chung's slides, who's going to be talking tomorrow on Ruby to Ruby, which is really awesome, will be available on the OpenRain blog. Uh, sometime really soon. We are hiring in Phoenix, so if you're in Phoenix, you don't necessarily have to be a Ruby developer, but if you're a bright person and want to work with other bright uh, Ruby developers, uh, come see me. And so there's really, this thing's broken up into three distinct parts. The first one is that why should we really care about point to point, to point or peer-to-peer -peer applications, whatever, within Ruby? Um, and I was just talking to James a couple minutes ago and kind of making the observation that client-side development doesn't seem to be a major focal point of Ruby development. And I think that's unfortunate um, because you know, we all use desktops, we interact with GUIs, we do all these wonderful things with GUI apps not written in Ruby. And you know, seeing a lot of Apple computers, obviously a very high percentage of Ruby users or Ruby developers are using Mac computers. Um, I find it kind of odd that you know, we haven't spent a lot of time focusing on GUI frameworks, especially since Apple now supports, or as of today at least, uh, Ruby Coco and has some integration at least with Xcode. And so if you're kind of kosher with using Xcode or at least using the Objective-C objects which provide Ruby Coco bindings, you can create rich client applications with Ruby using the Ruby version which comes bundled with OS X. And so we have just like a really brief pr um, proof of concept demo just to show later um, on, which I, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on how it's actually done because it does get into Objective-C because uh, there is some in integration with that. Uh, but it is possible. We have all of the tools. It's just no one's really focusing on doing it. And so when we talk about P2P, um, I, in my opinion, it's really gotten pigeonholed into a couple of primary applications. Uh, I, I, I was doing my undergrad in the late 90s, and in, at that time, you know, if you remember Napster and how popular it was, especially in college campuses, primarily for downloading music. And so to me, when I think of peer-to-peer -peer networks, I'm primarily thinking of applications, you know, to download illegal things off of the internet, um, and you know all of the variants which surfaced after that, the Nutel the Nutellas, um, Kazaas, stuff like that, as well as Bonjour and iChat. Um, Bonjour is, you know, a pretty I think recognized name in being able to do peer discovery on a local area network, and instant messaging is just one of those examples. But really, that's such a small subset of possibilities that we can do with uh, peer-aware applications. I mean, and if we were just to sit down, have a couple beers, and just explore this concept in more detail, we can come up with a huge list of things that we could do and we should be doing, but we're not doing. And just to kind of go down some of the bigger bullet points, pair programming and team debugging. Um, quick show of hands, who here came to Ruby from either Java or .NET? See, now, rhetorical question. Like, how do you feel about the development tools which are available in Ruby compared to that in Java or .NET? And if you're like me, I am still somewhat frustrated because we have things, you know, Eclipse and the Ruby Development Toolkit or whatever RDT stands for, and that means has some support for Ruby, but I don't feel like Ruby is a first-class language in terms of the tools that are available to work with it. 
Um, and ever same thing from web services or in .NET, I mean, you can bust out a web service really quick. I mean, just to be honest with you, it's not in SOAP. REST is obviously a different story. Um, but there's some, there are some really key use cases. Uh, for example, with Eclipse, being able to do team debug, or not team debug, but at least remote debugging of threads running on your machine across the network, which is really useful because if you work in a development shop like I do, at numerous times during the day, I'm saying, uh, hey, could you come look at this? Because I'm missing something obvious, something's broken. Could you just physically walk over here and share my keyboard and pull up a chair and breathe on my neck and all that stuff um, while we try to figure out this problem? And you know, so I think it's pretty easy to envision some sort of, some better tool support where we can actually work together on a Ruby projects without um, having to actually physically share keyboards. And that, but that breaks our common, uh, our, the, the paradigm of document models that we're all accustomed to working with. For example, Microsoft Word, I think it's pretty absurd that in 2007, Microsoft Word for OS X still, is still like a single document, which I had on my keyboard, on my machine, and I email to you guys, and then you can email it, and you can email it back to me. That's pretty ridiculous. Colla collaboration. File sharing. You know, completely decentralized file sharing, configuration sharing, um, you know, grid computing, um, again, which is Mark is going to talk about, and MapReduce, you know, just kind of setting up arbitrary MapReduce servers on a given network to be able to take an ad hoc network like this room right now, where, you know, the majority of us have machines open or we're all doing something on the internet. Um, and there's a lot of compute power that's there. But for the scope of this 45 minute conversation, I'm not going to set up a server. I'm not going to spend three hours setting up a server just so we can use some core services in this room. Um, so there has to be some enabling technology that allows us to, to take advantage of, oh, I don't know, uh, revision control systems like Gitjur is a good example for us all to be able to sit here and start collaborating without worrying about all of this infrastructure. Um, and so all of these ideas aren't new, oddly enough. They've been around for quite some time. And in Java, and so I came from the Java space, uh, Juxta, JXTA, is one of those projects which tries to support this type of collaborative communication between Java processes, but in my opinion, falls short. And because in the typical Sun Java way, just huge implementation, uh, you know, specs up the wazoo, there's committees to discuss whether or not changes should, should, should get in. For, and for the size of the project, I mean, that's kind of absurd. Um, not very well documented, which I do find kind of strange. Um, and it's also inherently intestable. And so I, I think it's a really noble effort that Juxta is out there and it's still supported. But you know, if I can't test a piece of software you know, scientifically, I, I can't assert it's working right. I'm not going to be able to know if it's ready for release. And so it, Juxta to me, and there's books written about Juxta, you can buy them off Amazon used now for like 10 bucks. Um, so if you're interested in kind of like the history of the people trying to develop your, your applications, especially for the dex, desktop, you kind of have to look at this case. And uh, I have kind of a rant on why I feel it's inherently untestable um, on my blog, which you're free to flame me about um, at your discretion. And so enter Janetta. And so, uh, like I mentioned, Janetta is a gem that was released just a couple months ago. Uh, written in pure Ruby, which allows arbitrary Ruby processes on the same LAN to talk to each other, um, pro pro providing two primary services of peer discovery and object passing between Ruby processes. Uh, and that's very simple, I guess, in essence, but at the same time, it supports a lot of those cases we had before, because if we're both you know, using an IDE or some other application on our individual desktops, they need some mechanism to talk to each other. And you know, as, as has already been discussed today, I think to, to a great extent, there are I.O. problems in Ruby with regarding to performance. Threading is a big issue, and we'll touch, touch about some of those individually um, and how you should address those if you're planning and writing a desktop application which, should, which needs to talk to other desktop applications. And so there, there are a couple of primary goals um, of the gem which make it somewhat distinct, I think, in the space. Uh, there are other options available to you. Uh, and last year, you know, there were test JOR was one that came out, app JOR, lots of JOR uh, based things, which are all are primarily based on DNS SD. And DNS SD is a natively compiled implementation of ZeroConf, which is Apple's, you know, the Bonjour rendezvous implementation, whatever. Um, and that's all in good, but at the same time, you know, there are some drawbacks to using native things also because we kind of lose some of the design power and flexibility of using pure Ruby. And so the, and we also have some portability issues too, at least in theory. Uh, and so portability is a big thing. Having few or little dependencies 
Uh, if you caught James Block's presentation just a couple hours ago, um, he talks a lot about inversion of control and how you know it's kind of unnecessary to use needle and copelands in a lot of cases. And I, I really identify that because <laughs> I, uh, coming from the Java space, you know, I tried to use needle and copelands at the time and found it pretty much unnecessary. But yet in this particular case of Junetta, it's actually I think a good example of a, an application which does use this inversion of control without needing any sort of inversion of control, control container. We'll go to that. Enable collaboration, low learning curve. It, it, it took me a long time to get a basic Hello World example running on Juxta. And one of the demos that we'll show today is an instant messenger client, which in about 60 lines is a complete group chat where everybody here can just you know, fire up and start talking instantly. There are some caveats to that, um, but that's pretty powerful. And you know, when you can do something that powerful in so few lines, you kind of just have to wonder, you know, maybe there is something right going on. Um, and no dependencies, to be honest, uh, there, it, there is a dependency in Ho uh, right now, which in theory shouldn't be necessary. But aside from that, it doesn't use event machine. It doesn't really have any reason to depend on anything else. Although if you have fast thread available, it will use it and uh, it will help uh, performance a bit. So a technical overview of what actually happens within uh, Junetta. It provides asynchronous peer discovery. Um, some of the networking concepts, you know, we could talk for a long time about those, but we won't get into too much detail. UDP via subnet broadcast. I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody. Um, basically, there's only a couple ways to, def to find all of you guys on the network. And the two primaries, one is a centralized server, but that's not one of the design goals of Junetta. It's supposed to, we're supposed to be able to find each other without doing anything else, uh, without any servers. So that's not really not an option. And the other is UDP broadcast, where I can just send a packet out to the Wi-Fi network, and each of you guys, if you're listening, on a special uh, address and UDP port, you're going to get that broadcast packet and know that I'm available and be able to respond to me directly with your data. Asynchronous peer I.O. This is where things kind of get interesting because Genera allows you to receive data from peers and send data for peers without actually writing any I.O. code, um, which is good and bad because you know you could probably do things which are going to use a lot of memory. Um, you can get things backlogged in, the, in an outbound message queue, which you know, you might not know about if your peer doesn't receive them. If all of you guys simultaneously close your laptops and I'm in the middle of sending a big text file to you, I, I can't guarantee that you're going to get that. You can't guarantee that you're going to receive that because I can't control what you guys are doing in your machines. And lots of threads. Because of the nature of this constant I.O. going on, for example, if everybody in this room were in the same chat room, which is completely decentralized and we're all sending each other messages, that's a lot of I.O. going back and forth. And so if I have 100 people sending me data, I, and I have to read all of that concurrently, I, in, in the Genetta model at least, it's going to have 100 threads going on. And for performance reasons, and in Ruby 1.8, that's not going to work for very large scale cases. Um, and so in other, uh, other run times outside of the MRI, and that should improve dramatically. But as an example, you know, if there are 100 people here, and the, the Ruby thread schedule, it's, I think it's like a 10 millisecond slice, which is allocated. And so with 100 people, in theory, if I have that 100 threads going on, it could take a second before my thread connecting directly to you gets CPU time to be able to receive that data. And that's really unacceptable. The current requirements. Uh, if, you, if you install the Genetta gem, it'll run OS X or Linux on the 1.8 uh, uh, MRI runtime. I really, 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 really want to get JRuby running, but I'm having uh, some issues with Socket. And so if you can help me with that, I'll give you a t-shirt or a beer or something like that. I really love a patch. Because I'd love to get it running on JRuby. Um, there are, there's just maybe like four lines in the entire gem which need to be changed. Um, so I'll love you forever, BFF. Uh, inside the magic. Um, we, yeah, we, we talked a little bit about this. Most of the magic is in the networking and multi-threading and that the Junetta engine itself is a facade which allows you to talk to your peers and integrate with your peers without having to really know what's going on under the covers. And so I think that's really powerful. Uh, the networking magic itself, just to cover a few terms, IP address, you know, who, wh whatever your distinct node is on the network. Uh, one kind of unique property about Junetta is that you can run multiple peers logically on the same machine. And so you'll need to use a different port number, but if for some reason, oh, like testing, for example, you want to launch five instances of the same application on your machine, maybe they're going to be mocked out to some extent, but you can test it actually on your local box. Um, port number, uh, the way I describe it to my parents is a, a, a mailbox at an apartment complex. <laughs> Just defines you know what unit in that computer that our, our data should go to. UDP is how peer discovery works in Genetta. Bonjour is um, the same the same way actually. 
uh, and because UDP can be used to broadcast data across networks. TCP, transmission control protocol, if I want to send data to a specific person that I find, it's going to use a direct TCP connection because I don't, I don't need to broadcast that, that out to everybody. So I'm going to make a direct connection via TCP and send it directly to them. Um, a subnet, uh, Janetta, unlike Juxta and unlike some other libraries available, it does not attempt to work across the internet. It is a local area network only technology. And that was very intentional because the connections you have to go through to get this type of thing working across the internet are very complex. And so it's just the opinion of the gem that let's not do that. If you need to do that, use something else. Um, because you start to get into issues like NAT traversal, which is a, a whole other topic. Um, getting through proxies and other sorts of corporate firewalls, things like that, which is just kind of a nightmare. And the whole gem is less than like 40K. Um, so it's, it's just not something it handles. Uh, and so if you're kind of wondering what type of network this is going to work on, really uh, the UDP broadcasts get blocked, tend to get blocked at, at borders. Or, so whatever the, the router, you know, if you're in a small home office network, those packets that discover other peers aren't going to go out to the internet. And, uh, Vice versa, peers on other people's networks aren't going to get to you if you're on just a local area network. The, the whole concept of using Jernetta revolves around peers and peer handlers, where it's just an event engine, kind of. And if, you kind of, if you're kind of familiar with the event machine, where you're like getting events out, managing state, and stuff like that, um, once you start the engine within your application, you're going to get starting events out. A peer came online. A peer sent you this data. A peer just unregistered. A peer came, you know, updated their metadata information. Everything's based off events. and so. If you already have a GUI application, GUI applications tend to be event-based, right? Because you click on a button and there's some handler or listener which gets fired to handle that. Um, that logic is yours. And so all you have, really have to do is define what happens when that event occurs. And it'll automatically call that logic. So it's pretty, and we'll have examples of that. So it's pretty easy to use. The threading issues uh, are a, a bit troubling. and. It, with, with, with green threads and Ruby 1.8, there are some benefits to it. One thing that you know, people don't talk about very much is that it, the consistency across platforms is actually really nice. Um, and if you remember Java back in the 90s, we went through this same thing, it seems like, where it, it actually, we, when they first switched to native threading and allowed the kernel to do uh, scheduling across different threads of the same process, we had variations across different operating systems. And so what would happen is that as a developer, I'd be working on Linux under JBoss or Tomcat or whatever was popular at the time. And I would go into production on a Solaris machine, which has a, a completely different kernel. And there'd be problems with threading or something. There is a mutex that was deadlocking somewhere. And we'd look at this locally and say, I can't reproduce this. What's going on? The reason is because with native threads, or excuse me, with green threads, they're just consistent across all platforms. And we don't really have that benefit with native threads. But the, the pros, or rather the cons to green threads, I think far outweigh this. And that's the way you know, the Ruby community is heading in general. So I don't think we should fight it. Uh, Ruby specific calls, uh, like thread that kill, for example, you won't see that in, in post POSIX thread implementations. And that's a good thing. Uh, single CPUs, just kind of quick survey also. Of your primary development machine, who has a, whose machines have only one CPU? Nobody. Okay, how many people, and just to kind of prove this hypothesis, how many people have two or more CPUs on their primary development machine? Yeah. So, <laughs> green thread's bad because on green threads, we can only use one of those CPUs at a given time. And just as an example, some of our web applications you know, are just so pro test first development that you know, they could, those tests could take 30 minutes, an hour, or possibly more on a slower machine. And part of that's just because they can't execute across two, two CPUs. And so this is a big problem. We've got to fix this. And of course, a, a lot of people are working on it. All right, so let's actually get to some code. Or actually, uh, no, let's talk about a couple of these uh, other points. Uh, green threads are probably going to be slower than native. Um, and so performance-wise, you know, if using this Junetta engine, that I want to send you a gigabyte of data, that's, that's not going to fly for a couple of reasons. Also because of loading data into memory before sending it out across the network. And so there are some cases which aren't really going to work too well. And also debugging and testing. And this goes back to the tool support issue that you know, we have in .NET and Java. But I, don't flame me, or do flame me, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I still feel like we don't have very good tools to debug multi-threaded applications, and especially with testing multi-threaded applications, because I, I don't know how to use RSpec to, to test something which has asynchronous components running inside of it. 
I just don't. I mean, I, I guess I could you know, start mocking stuff out. I could try to instrument the thread scheduler. I, I really don't know how to test this stuff. So that's kind of a fundamental issue. All right, so actual code. Let's actually develop something. Uh, when you actually want to add peer awareness to your application, this is pretty much the first thing you'll do. You're going to create a Juneta engine. And uh, if you want to get all technical about it, this is Fowler type 3 inversion of control, which is just a fancy way of saying you pass in the logic that you want to execute from these different device types when you create the engine. So it's all at construction time. There's no complicated XML or YAML or anything like that. Um, and they're all optional also. So you can create an engine which just sits there churning and doesn't do anything, although you probably wouldn't want to do that. Uh, so you just provide either procs or uh, or objects which implement a call method, which is basically the same thing. Uh, and then there's four different types of events. In, peer, in this particular slide, peer handler is what gets executed when somebody sends you data. And so my handler, assuming that implements on this next slide, the call method message, going back here, you can see this is very simple. As soon as, as, soon as it gets a message, it's basically just going to print, it's a, and it's a, a basic message object of that type, it's going to print some text field with inside of it to the console. So uh, that actual logic is very simple, and of course, this is many more lines than it actually needs to be. We could do this in one line if we wanted, and just specify a proc without defining the myhandler type. But you know, if you want to be explicit, I mean, this is how this is how you could go about doing it. Um, and then below, I sort the engine itself. Uh, peer port. If you want to run multiple instances on your same machine, you'll probably uh, not want to use a random port, I mean, you probably want to actually pick one and, and stick to it when you actually deploy applications. Groups is a kind of a cool mechanism because it allows all of our genetic based applications on the same network to talk to each other but have some way of distinguishing what each application is capable of doing. And so in my examples, uh, I, I think it's, my group is called IM example. Uh, and I have a Rails-based example which discovers other Rails apps on the same network, um, kind of like AppJour, which is a, a similar gem. And uh, that has a different group. Uh, stop on shutdown. Threading uh, is, is also one of those things where when you exit an application, you need to make sure you're shutting down cleanly, especially because I.O. could be going on. And that even though the user on my local machine clicked close, uh, that it, it's only polite to tell anybody else that I'm talking to across the network that I'm going down. <laughs> Of course, you can't enforce that because we're all, we're, we're, I mean, if I, you close your laptop to play it again, I can't control that. Um, and you're going down whether I like it or not. But stop on shutdown is just like a little helper method which makes sure that threads get shut down fairly cleanly. Um, in the end, the, because of the threading which happens internally to handle I.O., uh, you just call engine.start, that last line j.start, and as soon as you call that, other peers on the network are going to be seeing you. And uh, we'll, we'll see that in a few minutes here. Um, if you don't want to be seen but you still want to keep the uh, engine around a memory, you can call stop. You can start it again, you can restart it, you can do whatever you want with it. And uh, as I mentioned before, you can also create multiple engines in memory. So defining event handlers, yeah, these are the two ways that I mentioned. Uh, you can either create a proc, and the peer appears actually in a uh, type, um, which is documented in the, in the generic documentation. Class my handler, def call, peer connection, it's, just, it's a, two synonyms for saying the exact same thing, just do whichever way makes more sense to you. Here's some explicit information on the different types. As I mentioned, peer handler is what you have to, to provide, the logic you have to provide when somebody actually sends you data. And a registered handler is what, ha what happens when I discover you on the network for the first time. And so under most cases, you know, maybe that's only going to happen when you first open your laptop and you start your application and then uh, you might work for 10 minutes, then decide you want to leave, you'll jump off the network. Peer unregistered handler would get called because my, my local machine will notice that you went offline. And then peer updated handler, uh, every four seconds by default, uh, each engine instance will send a metadata update to everybody else in the network. Uh, there are kind of cool hacky things you can do with that under the covers if you want to be clever. Uh, but really it's just a mechanism to know that this person is indeed still there and I shouldn't make any assumptions about them going offline or anything like that because they're still on the network. So let's, let's build this instant messenger application. Let's actually write, you know, complete, complete this code because we've kind of talked about handling peer events, but we haven't talked about how we actually send stuff to other peers on the network. Or really how do we even, you know, know who's on the network to start with. Uh, so sending, 
is much, much easier because we've already created our engine. It's already on the network. Everybody knows we're there. We've started to figure out. Our, our engine has started to collect, say, oh, you're online. I noticed you. I noticed you. I noticed you. And that generally happens within four seconds. Um, and so we've created this basic message object, which has, it has a name and a text, um, and then called the Junetta dot send to known peers. And by default, every peer on the local air network, which is in my groups, will get this object now. So that's pretty cool, because like one line, just send it to everybody that is going to care about me on the network, and all of a sudden they're going to get the object. Uh, the way that the actual marshalling works, it's, it actually just serializes it to YAML. And so anything that can be serialized to YAML and uh, unmarshaled back into an object state via YAML can be sent by Juno just automatically out of the box. Uh, there, in the future, there's going to be uh, different ways of registering serialization mechanisms. So if you want to send XML, eventually you'll be able to send XML, but right now it's all YAML based. And the other nice thing about that is it also means that in theory, you know, if you wanted to write another thing on the network which is not written in Ruby, you'd be able to handle that as well because YAML is very generic. There are things to handle and you know, send and generate YAML in every language. And so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, in this middle area of code, who are my peers? Self.known peers. If you have an area, um, if, let's say you had a GUI part of your view, it just shows everybody that's online. Kind of like what iChat and Bonjour does. It shows you know, uh, you know, Preston Lee, you know, green, little green dot. Uh, and then you double click, double click that, that dot and you know, start typing. Self.known peers allows you to get information on who is known on the network at a given point in time. Uh, you, if you iterate through that, you, it'll be keyed by a UUID which is almost certainly unique across the network. It's not actually universally unique. Uh, as well as a peer connection object, which allows you to get their IP address. If for some reason you need to know their IP address uh, explicitly, you can get, get it from there. If you want to know their port number uh, explicitly, you can get it from there. If you want to add other metadata, maybe, that gets sent to peers, you can hack that object and uh, add additional data to it. All right, so let's, let's actually do some demos. Uh, so this is actually kind of dangerous and <laughs> uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that live demos, you know, those, those things that you should never do, and I, I'm going to do it. Uh, and the other thing is because of security. And that genetics is currently a tool. It, th there are some very fundamental like, computer science hard problems about authorization of peers who you don't know. And there's things like Diffie-Hellman, which allow us to exchange keys without necessarily having any sort of predefined data between us, but that doesn't necessarily solve this issue of authorization. So I don't, if I have an application, for, for example, which does distributed testing or distributed computing, I might want everybody on this side of the room to be able to run their tests on my machine, but not the people on this side of the room, because people on this side of the room are evil, and I, I want to prevent that. And so we can't currently really prevent that, and that's just kind of something that needs to be thought out a little bit more. Um, and honestly, a lot of that's going to be very application specific because it could be the case that maybe you just want to make a uh, queue on, on the server. You know, it does nothing. It, que it queues jobs and then there's other things on the network which consumes those jobs and that's it. There probably isn't too much of a security risk. I mean, maybe you're going to cheer root your, your Ruby process on your machine or take other security measures, but you know, it, it's, it's going to be very application specific on how you deal with those things. Um, things we can't demo right now are JRuby, again, help, I need a, I need a patch for that, as well as Ruby 1.9, because Ruby 1.9 uses native threads. And there are some things, you know, back to the portability of things that, threaded applications which are running currently on 1.8, a lot of those applications are going to have problems because there are calls that just aren't going to make sense when we take green threads and make them native. So I, I, don't, I don't think... Uh, that's necessarily going to be trivial for, for some uh, Ruby interpreter implementations, but in this particular case, I don't think it should be too hard. So let's get out of here. <clears throat> Got a mirrored display. Cool. All right, so a couple things. First thing I'm going to do, and I have about you know, eight or so terminals open here. I'm going to launch, um, and all these examples come with a gem, and so, you know, if you're sitting uh, at home or something you want to play with it, you'll have all the same code with you. I'm currently using Janetta 0.1.6, which is the current release of it. All right, so we're going to launch this network status example, and what this is going to do, and I, I'm on my own little private network, so just for safety purposes. Um, 
And I'm seeing all the other peers on my network, which in this case is just me, but I'm running a whole bunch of different applications on the same network. Um, in this groups column over here, that is too dark. Uh, you see I am example, and so I'm running an instant messenger client as well as a Rails application, which is broadcasting its presence to everything across the network. Um, and so we'll, we're just going to leave this open here as we're, as we're doing these demos to see what's going on. Now I'm going to launch an instant messenger client. Sure. Uh oh. What's the shortcut for that? Is it Command Plus? Command Plus. Oh, there we go. And I'm, I'm going to launch a bunch of these. Uh, this, this instant messenger is 59 lines of code. Here's the actual code, just to prove. And it's going to allow me to talk to other people in kind of like an ad hoc chat room. So one with, now, unlike, kind of like IRC, but without any IRC server available, where when I'm bringing these peers online or these instant messenger clients online, they're automatically finding each other and are figuring out how to talk, which is pretty cool. Where's that network status? Okay. So coming online, this will be Alice. Okay, I'll start up. Bob. And on, this, on, on Charlie over here, I'm going to start with a third one. Um, but I'm going to start in debug mode. We're going to see a, a ton of uh, just general presence messages. And it's kind of interesting because if you can kind of, I don't know if you can read that, it's kind of small, but uh, we can see a, a lot of things, a lot of events that are being detected by this peer on the network. And so over here, for example, this is Bob, and Bob will say hi. Oh, hi, Alice. And on Alice's console, she saw that text for, um, pretty much instantaneously. So these are distinct Ruby processes. Again, there's no server going on. They just found each other somehow on my local network and are talking to each other. Um, back here in this the, uh, debug mode for, for this third instant messenger client, um, we see registering peer, peer updated events, lots of kind of, uh, the, the numbers are UUIDs of different peers across the network. And so we're seeing these broadcast messages actually going around and they're not really being handled. There's nothing actually being done with them, but the engine itself is detecting them, and there's threading obviously going on in the background. So even though if we were to type a message here and send it to other peers, there's the message on, some, on another peer, uh, you know, there's still stuff going on in the background with Ruby threading. And this works in this case because there's about three peers. There are those caveats of very large numbers of threads in the Ruby thread scheduler kind of being a performance bottleneck there, but this is still pretty powerful. Uh, so there's our instant messenger. Now, that's an example of pure point-to-point -point applications or peer-to-peer or, or, or -peer applications which don't need a centralized server. Unlike BitTorrent, for example, which does need some sort of tracker to find peers or in most cases. Um, but now let's do another example which does require a centralized server. And it's actually that Q example that I mentioned. Um, so what I'm going to do is fire up another example which comes with a gem called QServer. And so this is by itself not, if you look at the code, it doesn't actually do anything. But it's a, a queue, just a, a thread safe FIFO queue on the network, which is going to be available and broadcast itself to everybody else that wants to potentially use it. And so if you had, I don't know, maybe you're writing a, an application to render frames for Shrek 7 or something, and you wanted to delegate rendering every frame to a different machine, uh, you might fire up something like QServer, where the server concept is something I came up with. I said, this process is going to be a server. It's not something the engine enforces upon you, but it's just a concept they added on top of it. Uh, so I fired up my QServer, and it's not doing anything. No one else is using it. So let's, let's start using it. And a client. And just to make it more interesting, I'm going to fire up a second client. All right. So now I have two clients, and there's stuff going on here, and then we have a server. And so I'm going to leave it on a server while I talk about this. Uh, and so the clients are really having two jobs. One is they're producing work to do. And once they produce work to do, they look for a server on the network. And once they find it, they throw this work at it, and so it gets enqueued. And so this server is kind of managing all of the work that's being produced on the network. And then once the server detects that it has work to do, it finds any client which is available to do it and says, hey, you, you need to execute this, do this work. Uh, whatever it is, go off and do it. Uh, and so on the server side, we see that there's jobs getting found. They're somehow getting to the server. 
um, and then sending to peer as soon as that job gets in, it's delegating that back off to the server. So we don't really have any CPU uh, crunch time going on on this queue server process because all the actual work is being delegated to the clients. Now on the client side, since the clients have those two jobs, like I mentioned, they, they create jobs and they consume jobs. Uh, so creating job, uh, in this case 606, and then in this case the server sent the job right back to the client to say, you know what, you need, to, you need to actually process this job. But then we see below this a bunch of jobs which are getting created but aren't getting processed by this peer. And so if we look at another peer, we see that this guy's actually processing, it's consuming more jobs than it's producing. And so we've, even though this is a fairly trivial example, we've created our own distributed work system, you know, to crunch different data um, using different processes without very much integration work at all. Um, and so when we're talking about building bigger applications, I think this is the type, I think this is the right direction that uh, desktop apps should be going with. I think our desktop applications especially should be able to talk to each other a lot. It's one of those kind of few benefits that we're having, that it seems like, these days to doing a desktop application as opposed to a web application um, because we can have all of this rich access to the file system and, and compute power that might be a little harder to leverage on the web. Uh, and lastly, we have a, oh no, not last, we've got two more demos and I've only got a couple minutes left, I think, so I'll try to make it fast. <clears throat> we have a Rails app. So I'm just going to restart real quick. This is a just completely bare bones Rails app. There's absolutely nothing going on except uh, it uses Junetta under the covers to detect other things that are going on the network. <clears throat> and there we go. And so it's already picked up something on the network. It's going to refresh every second and hopefully it'll pick up more peers. Um, I'm short on time, so I'm going to jump back to the presentation. Um, in terms of GUI apps also, uh, Mark actually busted out a really quick uh, Coco, or Ruby Coco application. <clears throat> To, as a proof of concept that uh, this is a paradigm that is worth pursuing. And we see t text appearing under the console. Again, I'm short in time, so I'm just going to jump out of this. But these are completely separate processes using Coco natively via Objective-C and Ruby on OSX using the version of Ruby which ships with OSX Leopard. So the entire application, Ruby and, uh, all the Ruby dependency of Junetta and everything is bundled into an app application bundle just like every other OSX application is doing, except it's using Ruby under the covers. That's pretty cool. All right, let's hop back to the slides. I'm <clears throat> seeing the same thing. Okay, so is it production ready? Would I ship an application with this? No, do not do that. Um, I think it will be, but it just isn't right now. Um, there are a couple things that need to happen. One is the current version does have a small memory leak, which, uh, yeah, is kind of bad. So I wouldn't use it in production probably for, for that reason alone. But also because of the thread scaling issues in the MRI currently, um, I wouldn't use it until JRuby is working, uh, potentially after, you know, maybe Ruby 2.0 or Rubinius, you know, one, one other of these uh, native thread interpreters is much more popular. Also, authentication authorization, uh, it doesn't support that out of the box. If you want to add it, if you want to encrypt data to another peer, sure, go ahead, go, go for that. It's just not provided by the gem itself because the gem isn't opinionated on how you should talk to other peers. Uh, so in the future, yep, I already addressed that. And so my, I guess my, my summary challenge, and if you take something away from this presentation, my challenge to the people here and as people that are, are developing these rich client GUI applications is that we need a tool. <laughs> and that tool to me is a supported collaborative IDE for Ruby written in Ruby. The IDE part itself in Ruby for Ruby has been attempted before and there are some um, kind of small open source projects which address that and I think that is absolutely the right direction. But also I think there's so many advantages to DSLs, metaprogramming in Ruby that don't really work so hot in Java and .NET, we should have a tool which reflects how awesome Ruby is. And I think, especially in the enterprise, you know, having that type of tool available um, will go a long way to Ruby adoption and really help fuel growth. Here's a few examples which I kind of draw inspiration from. The one on the left is called Open Croquet. And it's, it's kind of hard to describe succinctly, but it's basically kind of like uh, Second Life, but for developers. So, you know, this full 3D world, which you can create and interact with, uh, it's in small talk, by the way, so it's not, it's not really directly related to Ruby, um, but 
you know, you can right-click on objects or r change the code of what's happening while it's running. And this, I, this thing is doing some sort of gene simulation or something, I don't know. But you can interact with the code directly inside the tool itself. The middle one on the bottom, I know this is really small and hard to read, it's called SubEthEdit, which is um, a commercial product, kind of like TextMate. It's just like a basic te text editor, but it does collaborative editing. And it supports this paradigm of pairwise development much better than we currently do. Because screen sharing to me, that's not pair programming. <laughs> that's screen sharing. And we're kind of missing the point if we think that screen sharing is as far as we can go in collaborative development. The one on the right is uh, symbol it's a Symbolics product, which in Symbolics, I believe they're, I don't think they're even around anymore, but they, they developed a Lisp machine uh, in the early 90s, I think. And, which was just an awesome concept to start with, but again, Lisp, so didn't, didn't really take off. But you could edit the kernel while it was running, which is kind of crazy. The actual operating system kernel, the actual tools to do all of that were built into the operating system itself as well as all the libraries. Really crazy concepts, and I think just because of the dynamic nature of Ruby, we can do a lot of these things. We really can, um, but we need to start focusing some attention on them. So in summary, Thank you. <laughs>